unmute. All right. So we're taking a little bit of a break from the children's Bible story, and I wanted to uh, talk a bit about the passion of the Christ. That's kind of a weird word, you know, we don't, we don't really hear it much in evangelical churches, and they call this Passion Week. And I, I didn't do my homework because I wanted to focus on something else, but I, don't, I used to know why they called it Passion Week, and I don't anymore. So I might have to have somebody look that up. Google it. <laughs> yeah, because I'm curious. I don't remember. I don't remember what it was. So when we talk about this week that led up to Jesus's death on the cross, um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in there. If you remember, as you read through the Gospels, we're just talking about that time from Jesus's triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, which today is, to Friday when he was crucified. And then, of course, Sunday is the resurrection. And so when, when we think about that, well, you know, it's a week. What all could he have done in there? There are more events recorded during that week of time that Jesus did than throughout the rest of the Gospels. He was busy. It's kind of like, you know, yeah, I work with some miracles here, lead some people to me here, and now I've got a week left. All right, I, I got to get some other stuff done. And he went on this whirlwind of just things that have to be done. Now, I need to remind you that when we talk about the things that Jesus did, that one of the things that the apostle John tells us is that there are so many things that Jesus did, there aren't enough books in the world to contain them. Okay, so to kind of drive that point home just a little bit, According to extensive seminary research throughout the Gospels, we only have an account of 59 days of Jesus's ministry. So from the beginning of Matthew 1.1 to the end of the book of John, we know there's overlap in the Gospels. They talk about the same events from a different angle. Jesus started at the age of 30 in his ministry. And he was crucified at the age of 33. So he ministered approximately 1,100 days. But of those 1,100 days, we only have recorded 59 of Jesus's ministry. And think of all of the things that Jesus did that we see recorded in those 59 days. So the other balance of the 1100 days we don't have recorded and he was doing stuff then too i mean he wasn't sitting on the couch you know watching the bachelor so i'm going to be curious to know what did you do on those other days let me hear some of those stories okay and that's going to be really cool thank you all right so the passion the first records of the term Passion Week came from the 1300s. In this context, the word passion is used to refer to the period of trials and suffering that Jesus experienced before his death, or the biblical account of these events. So that really doesn't define where passion, where, where that use of the word passion came from. But that's, that's why they call it the Passion Week. So this one says the word passion comes from the Latin word for suffering. Ah, okay. Crucifixion of Jesus is accepted by many scholars and is accepted accepted. The Lord of Jesus is the Lord of 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 the Lord
Jews from the beginning up through the Roman Empire. And then Tacitus was one of the church fathers who did a lot of writing about um, the things that Christ did. So the passion is from the word suffering. Pretty cool. All right. So two months before the Passover, mute myself here, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. At that point, Jesus became a marked man. There was times before that in his teachings that the leaders of the Jewish religion were trying to trick him and trap him, but at least that was just to discredit him. That's all they were trying to do is just discredit him so that followers wouldn't follow him anymore. But by the time that he raised Lazarus from the dead, now it's not just a point of discrediting him. We must silence him at any cost. And so basically they put a hit out on him at this point, okay? There's a price on his head. The chief priests and the Pharisees both wanted to kill both of them. They wanted to kill Jesus, obviously, but why would they want to kill Lazarus? He's living proof, yeah. He's living proof that this is not a mere man. This guy has power over the dead. If you remember, it specifically tells us that Lazarus was dead for three days and he was beginning to stink. So decomposition had already been set in. So it's not that he was passed out for a while in a coma, whatever. No, no, no. he was decaying already. And so when Jesus brought him back to life, uh, Mary and Martha were a wealthy family. And as was the custom, you purchase, if you can, mourners. Because the more mourners that you have, then the bigger show you can put on showing that you are a wealthy family. That's just how things were done back then. And so Mary and Martha had hired a lot of mourners. So there was a big crowd here at the tomb of Lazarus when Jesus raises him from the dead. So it's not just Lazarus is back and said, yeah, I was dead and Jesus raised me. Oh yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, go, go, go away. But now we've got all these witnesses too. And so now you've got to remove the proof. And so to kill Lazarus, they would say, oh yeah, we saw Lazarus raised from the dead. Well, where is he now? Well, he's dead. You see? So they wanted to make sure that Lazarus was dead as well. So it tells us that it wasn't the appointed time. Although Jesus knew that he was going to die on a cross eventually, he did evade the previous attempts. John 7.30 says, at this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come, okay? Now, you're going to see this theme here, Luke 4, 29 and 30. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him over the cliff. But Jesus passed through the cloud, crowd and went on his way, okay? Gary and I were having a conversation this week many conversations and one of the things that we was talking about we were talking about was how hitler was on this rampage against the jews now really we know he had mommy issues his mother was a jew he hated his mom and so he hated all the jews because his mom was a jew that really was the motivation behind it but one of the things that he sold his country on and many here in america in the late 20s and the early 30s was that the Jews need to be punished for what they did to Jesus, called them the Christ killers. And so it was kind of like a religiously motivated event. We need to punish the Jews for what they did to Jesus. And as a matter of fact, when Jesus was being crucified, one of the things that was being shouted from the crowd was, May his blood be on us and our children. So that's actually part of that curse. 
the Jews are still persecuted throughout history. And one of those reasons is because they were an instrument in Jesus's death. But as we see from these scriptures here, who really was in control? Jesus was. That's why we know on this side of the cross, it says that Jesus laid down his life. His life wasn't taken from him. And when he was on the cross, he gave up his spirit. His spirit wasn't taken from him. He gave it up willingly. Okay? That's why that act of his sacrifice is so special in our redemption to bring us back to the Father. John 10, 39 says, at this, they tried again to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. So he knew when the time for the cross was. And all these other attempts to grab him we're going to be unsuccessful because that time had not come yet. And then also remember Herod unsuccessfully tried to kill him when he was less than two years old. Back there at the Christmas story. Okay. So throughout his life, there were opportunities tried to kill him, to remove him from the story. And because it wasn't his time, it didn't happen. Now, I need to take a break from that a little bit and talk a little bit about the Jewish calendar and Jewish time telling, okay? So the Jewish calendar is called Luna Solar. Luna, lunar, meaning the moon, and then solar, meaning the sun. So what that means is they use the events of the moon and the events of the sun together to help determine when times seasons and things are. And that kind of makes sense because in the beginning, in Genesis, when it tells us, it says that God created the sun and the moon in order to mark time. It didn't say that it was for light and biology and to show gravity and things like that. And light had already been created before that. So the purpose for the sun and the moon was still being used and is still being used today for the Jewish calendar. So it's regulated by the positions of both the moon and the sun. It consists usually of 12 alternating lunar months of 29 and 30 days. And of course, they've got different names for their months. So the month of Heshvan and Kislev sometimes has 29 or 30 days that switch, depending on the year. So that means because it's following the moon and the sun, some of their years are 353 days long, some are 354, some are 355, but then there's also a leap year that they have. The leap year consists of an additional 30-day month. They get an extra month in leap year in order to make things line up again. Okay, and it's called first Adar, which always precedes the month of regular Adar, but during that year they call it second Adar. A leap year consists of either 383, 384, 385 days and occurs seven times during every 19 year period, the so called metonic cycle. It's messed up, it's hard, you can't keep track of it. They actually had special priests whose job was to keep track of the calendar. That's all they did was keep track of the calendar. There's problems with this, though. Among the consequences of the lunisolar structure are these. The number of days in a year can vary from 353 to 385 days. And second, the first day of the month can fall on any day of the week that day varying from year to year. And all of their holidays that they had are based on what day of the month it was. So they couldn't keep track. And it's kind of like some of our holidays. You know, some of our holidays are stapled in place. 
Do you know when Lincoln's birthday is? Do you know when Washington's birthday is? Do you know when Valentine's Day is? Do you know when Christmas is? Those are stapled onto that date. But some of our other holidays move around, like Easter. Why? Because Easter is based on the moon, which means we're following a lunar calendar for Easter. And so Easter will move from early March to late April, okay? And it moves around every year because it's based on the moon. So we need to talk about the Jewish day. The Jewish day always starts at sunset or when three medium-sized stars would be visible, okay? Do you see Altair yet? No, nope. well, then it's not night yet, okay? So what they would do is, again, have a special priest, and he'd be up on the, the wall of the temple, and he's like, there's one, there's two. Oh, there's the third. Okay, it's night. Kind of weird, right? So they considered there to be 12 hours of night and 12 hours of day, regardless of what season they were in, because they really didn't talk about seasons. Their seasons weren't summer, spring, winter, fall. It was harvest time, planting time, hot. You know, that was, that was it. They didn't have any particular season times. Now, today we know that sunset shifts, right? the time of sunset changes throughout the year. And it actually changes by about two minutes and seven seconds each day. So as we're heading towards summer, sunset's gonna get later by about two minutes, seven seconds each day. We know now because of astronomy that the amount of time that sunset shifts actually changes a little bit. Sometimes it can be almost three minutes, which is why now when you look at your calendars, especially like your uh, planting calendars from the, the uh, almanac and things like that, it'll say that there is a nautical twilight, an astronomical twilight, an actual twilight. And then you got sunset. So even today, we're confused about what to call sunset. Now, because of this, we've got some weird time-telling issues when we especially talk about Easter time. Because when was Jesus crucified and put in the tomb? Okay, first of all, what day of the week was it? Friday. Yeah, we call it Good Friday today, right? So it's Friday. And then he was in the tomb Saturday. And then he rose from the grave on Sunday. So here's the thing. So now we're going to start distinguishing. Well, was it like three days? We know that he said I'd be in the grave three days. So 24, 48, 72. So was he in the grave 72 hours? No, because he was rushed to be put in the tomb before sunset on Friday. So he was in the tomb before 6 p.m. on Friday. And he, they went on Sunday morning before dawn, before dawn to open up the tomb and to anoint his body in order to in, embalm him, okay? Well, that's not 72 hours. So the Bible's lying, it's all false, all your Christians are wrong and you're gonna to turn to dirt when you die. That's the argument that non-Christians will try to make. But the part that they forget is the way Jews tell time is different. If you are one second before 6 p.m., one second before sunset, they count that as a whole day. So he was put in the tomb before sunset on Friday. 
That counts all of Friday as one day. Then he was in the tomb all day Saturday. That's the second day. And they went on Sunday in order to open up the tomb again to embalm him. That's the third day. So he was in the grave for three days, like he said, even though really it was probably closer to, yeah, two days. Half day in front, half day in back, a full day in the middle, according to our calendar. Yeah, but you get an extra day at the end. Yeah, it's, it's strange time telling, but that's a good analogy. I hadn't thought to explain it like that before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So to make things even harder, the Romans realized that their holidays were shifting, where they would have a holiday that was supposed to be on a certain uh, sunrise or a certain moonrise of this day. And what happened, because the calendar was a 360-day calendar on average, over the years, their fall holidays started running into summer. And their spring holidays were falling into winter. So Julius Caesar, one of the emperors, said, we need to make an adjustment. So in three days, the date will be, and the year will be, and he made that adjustment. At that point, it started a reckoning of time of years called the Julian calendar because it was based on what Julius Caesar said. But by the time we get to like 1300 AD, things had shifted again and another correction had to be made. So Pope Gregory then declares on this day, it's going to be this date. And again, things shift and more adjustments were made to the calendar to now include scientific discoveries. And now we've got a 365.25 day long year of 12 months that change between 31 and 30 and sometimes 29, 28 days. So we still got these adjustments that have to be made. And that calendar is called the Gregorian calendar. So we're still using the Gregorian calendar today. But now if you try to use today's calendar to figure out the events during Jesus's lifetime, it's off by about four and a half years. And so zero AD doesn't correspond with the birth of Jesus, even though it's called AD and BC. And now they've even gotten away from that. So they call it now BCE, which is before the common era, instead of before Christ. And then CE instead of AD, meaning the common era. So again, the world is trying to take away the marker of Christ's, Christ's birth, Christ's death from us. So all of that about the calendar, okay? So any questions? No, what I'm, what I'm wanting to tell you is I'm, I'm trying to give you enough information so that if you're faced with someone saying, you know, the calendars don't, don't work. Jesus wasn't born in zero, I heard. You know, it's like, yeah, he was born about, for BC. Well, then how come they don't call that zero? Or you could say there's been a couple of changes to the calendar over history. But the Jews will still use the old calendar. Talk to Steve. Yeah. Yeah. I actually had to learn all that stuff and write it all down on a term paper for an astronomy class. So because astronomers still use the Julian calendar and not the Gregorian calendar. So yeah, it's all it's all messy. It's all messy. All right, so here we go. The first day, this is Friday, okay? So Jesus arrives in Bethany. We see that in Matthew and Mark and John. 
it says that he had dinner in Simon's house. Now, John has Jesus staying in Bethany with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Matthew and Mark have Jesus dining in the house of Simon the leper. Uh, one Edersheim, okay, this was a man who wrote a book called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah back in the 1800s. He is a reference that every, every Bible student will have this book. Okay, it is a history book that parallels all of the Gospels and lays it all out in a timeline. He bridges the difference by suggesting that Simon may have possibly been Martha's husband and the father of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Hence, scholars suggest that they were all in the same house. So a way to bring unity to the Gospels. Then we know in that encounter that Mary anoints Jesus. So the ointment Mary used on Jesus's head and feet, scripture tells us cost about 300 dinars, which is a year's salary, a bottle of perfume that cost a year's salary. And she breaks the alabaster jar, pours it all over Jesus's feet, and then wipes it up with her hair. And of course, the apostles are like, what would you do that for? You're wasting it. We could have used that by selling it and taking the money to feed the poor. As a matter of fact, 200 dinars was the amount that Philip told Jesus that they would need to buy enough bread for the 5,000 men, women, and children that were there listening to Jesus teach. Okay, pretty extravagant. Why would a person have a year's salary worth of perfume? <laughs> okay, so we get a hint because it was in an alabaster, alabaster jar. The alabaster jar was sealed. You actually had to break the jar open in order to use it. It wasn't meant to be used. It was an invest. It was an investment. Okay, so what you would do, like somebody today would go buy an ounce of silver or an ounce of gold in order to put in a closet and hold for a rainy day. It was an investment, something that she could use if she was widowed, that she'd be able to live on after that. Okay, so the fact that she broke this in order to pour it out it wasn't just a love offering for jesus she was basically liquidating her life savings this is to take care of when i've got nobody so by doing that to jesus it was actually a show to everyone i don't care about my future because jesus has my future a lot of faith okay but that's, there's a lot more depth in that story than, <laughs> yeah, 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 very good. All right, Saturday, nothing's recorded in any of the gospels of anything that Jesus did on Saturday. Should we be surprised? What is Saturday for the Jews? It's the Sabbath, okay? They're to do nothing on the Sabbath. So from sunset on Friday to sunset on Saturday, that's time that's dedicated to God. And so they do no work whatsoever. And so Jesus worshiped in the synagogue as was his custom. We see that and took it easy for the rest of the day. Okay. Sunday though, now we've got Palm Sunday. This is his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. All four of the gospels record this. So on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus asks Peter and John to go to Bethphage and bring him a colt of a donkey that had never been ridden. Bethphage means house of figs. That's important. It also refers to a species of late season figs that never appear ripe, even when they are edible. So Jesus tells them, you're going to go into this yard where you see a donkey and her colt. 
hide, bring them to me. So it wasn't just the cult of the donkey. It was the donkey too. You'll see that in Matthew. The people expected the Messiah to arrive on a big white stallion coming in with his sword and shield and everything as a mighty conqueror. But instead, Jesus comes in riding on this unbroken donkey's colt. That's a statement of meekness. In short, it was the meekness of majesty which was manifested entering the city with royal authority. It was a weird kind of ironic oxymoron kind of thing. He's on a donkey's colt, which is, you know, like Pedro going to get the coffee beans, you know? I mean, it is just like common laborer sort of thing. But the fact that he's having a procession coming into Jerusalem, with all of the shouts and the singing and everything going on was reserved for royalty. It was kind of weird. And I, people were looking at this saying, that's weird, but it's a party, that's party. So everybody's all celebrating out there, joining in with the procession. Now, think of the thoughtfulness of Jesus having the mother donkey accompany the colt. So there's no separation anxiety for the mother or the coat. Master didn't look over any details. Pretty cool. Point of prophecy, Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. Humble and mounted, what? On a donkey even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And that's hundreds of years earlier. Luke 19, verses 30 through 38. Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt who has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it just as they told him, or just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. And then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. So, so cool, the symbolism of what's going on. The palm leaves, I'll talk about that in just a minute. That's a sign of royalty. Okay, so if anybody royal was coming into city the palm leaves and laying the palm leaves down, that would be a sign of royalty. But what did it say that the people were doing? They were laying down their cloaks. So this is to cover the dirty ground. And as Jesus was crossing these cloaks, basically by them putting their cloaks on the ground, they are saying that he's not royalty, he's deity. They are proclaiming his being God by doing this. Oh, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, did you hear that? So a, a animal is skittish of crossing over something they're not familiar with. So crossing the ground is okay, because I've done that all my life. But now we've got something covering the ground. I don't know about that. Yeah, and Jesus had full control. Yeah, pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Jesus came into Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of the Passover. That's why our Easter date moves, because Easter is still lining up with Jewish Passover. 
And since their calendars are still using the lunar cycle, our Easter moves with that lunar cycle. He rode into the city on a donkey. The people welcomed him, welcomed him waving palm leaves and shouting, Hosanna, which is a prayer of praise and adoration, which meant save us now. Okay, so even Hosanna, when we shout it today, it means the same thing. Save us now. Okay, kind of weird for somebody who's already saved, though, to shout Hosanna just because of what it means, because we're already saved and we don't need to be saved again. Okay, all right. So why the palm branches? So back in Zechariah 9, verses 10 and 11, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war, house, war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your captives free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold O oh, prisoners of hope, palm branches. They aren't a sign of peace and adoration. They are a sign of rebellion against the oppression by Rome. They were a symbol of goodness, well-being, and most of all, victory. So when a Roman um, emperor would go out and win a battle, he would come back into Rome and they would have a victory parade for him. And so he'd be on the, the big white war horse. All of the armies would be behind him. Everything shined to a high gleam and everybody's waving palm branches as a sign of his victory over the enemy. So by the Jews welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem with the palm branches, the Romans are looking on at this. What are they doing? This is a nobody. He hasn't won any battles. What, why are they greeting him like this? So, you know, the Romans were pretty confused about everything that was going on. And that's why some of the Roman sympathizers were telling Jesus' apostles, y'all need to shut up and you need to tell these people to stop this shouting. Basically, we're going to make the Romans mad at us. And then we're really going to be in trouble. And then that's when Jesus said, if they stop shouting, then even the rocks would cry out. Okay, it's time to celebrate. That's the Messiah coming in. So they are welcoming in the king, emperor of the Jews, palm leaves, who would overthrow the oppressors and then ascend to the altar deity and offer sacrifice. So this is everything that was going on during Palm Sunday. So the date of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem corresponds with the 10th day of Nisan, the day on which the paschal lamb was chosen for sacrifice and separated from the flock for the Passover meal later in the week. So look for the pattern of reasons why Jesus waited until the week of Passover. Note that the symbolism alludes to the Lamb of God being set aside for the sacrifice. The palm branches were not only used to wave in praise and jubilation, but also to keep the dust settled by placing them on the ground since people were out in force to sing Hosanna in the highest, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This celebration of laying the palm branches down in Jerusalem was an annual event. They did it every year and they were using it to symbolize looking forward to when the Messiah would come. And so it's pretty exciting when they lay down the palm branches and the Eastern gate opens and here comes Jesus who they already knew as a great teacher and a great miracle worker. At this point, the people were not turned against Jesus. That was later. And so at this point, could you imagine what they were feeling? 
We knew it was him and now he's coming in and proving it. That's what they were thinking at this point. Josephus, yeah, he gives us most of our events about the way that the Jews celebrated things. So of course we've got things that are laid out in the Old Testament about what holidays to do, but a lot of the social things that we get comes from Josephus. There's an interesting contrast between the multitude of the heavenly host at Jesus's birth singing peace on earth. And now we've got this earthly group singing peace in heaven. Neat little contrast. The people were singing the Passover Psalm, which they would sing in a few days. It refers to the Messiah. Jesus planned his entry as a counter procession to the Roman entry on the west side of the city. That's how the Romans come in to conquer in the first place, and they would reenact it. You are a conquered people, so we're having a parade to show you how we conquered you. And so they would have a west entry parade. Jesus is doing an east century, east entry parade. Then Jesus goes back to Bethany. Day four, we've got a barren fig tree that's talked about in Matthew and Mark. The object lesson with the fig tree was fitting because remember, Bethphage, the name of the city means house of figs, okay? And the special kind of fig that even looks unripe when it still is ripe. And it's a late season fig, which means it's supposed to be there, okay? And so they're walking by and Jesus looks at the fig tree, it says he's hungry and he's like, there's no figs. It's supposed to have figs because it's a late season fig tree. And basically, what are you doing not producing? You might as well be dead. Curses the tree. And then at the temple, he cleanses the temple again. The guilty fled, but the blind and the lame stepped forward to be healed. This is on Monday. And then Jesus and his disciples go back to Bethany. Day two, uh, day five rather, this is Tuesday. It was the last day of Jesus's public ministry his last day in the temple. He arrived early in the city. He didn't leave for Bethany until late that night. Some scholars refer to this as the day of controversy and others as the day of rejection. It was both. So here we see the fig tree that he cursed the day before. Now it's withered. Peter points out that the fig tree is withered and Jesus responds with, have faith in God. Kind of a weird thing to say, but what Jesus was doing was giving Peter a lesson on prayer that includes instructions on forgiveness. The disciples are gonna to have to rely on prayer and forgiveness in order to get through the next days. So if you see the withered fig tree, you're looking at it, it's like this fig tree is dead, it's good for nothing. Might as well just cut it up and burn it. But Jesus instead says, have faith in God. That's just, that's weird. But what's he saying? Even though it might appear to be dead, have faith because with God, all things are possible. And the implication for the tree is God can bring that tree back to life. Okay. The implication that he's teaching the apostles here is I'm fixing to be dead. Have faith. I'll come back to life. So that's what's going on in that lesson. All right. So Jesus's authority gets challenged by the priests, the scribes, and the elders. This is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders are waiting for Jesus, and they wanted to find out by what authority could he whip the money changers out of the temple. This was a trick question. If Jesus responded by saying he had the authority to do it, then they would arrest him for megalomania, which is you are trying to be more than you actually are. You're just a rabbi. You have no authority. And they'd arrest him for interrupting everything that's supposed to be going on during this holy week. If he responded that his orders were from God, they would then arrest him for blasphemy because only God will talk to the high priest and to a prophet, according to them. 
Jesus read their motive as if it was posted on a billboard. He agreed to answer their question if they would answer his first. And he asked them whether John the Baptist's work, in their opinion, was human or divine. He's asking a trick question now. If they replied divine, then they would have to accept Jesus as the Messiah, because that was the basis of John the Baptist's preaching. If they said that John's teaching was human, then the people that followed John would riot because they were zealots, okay? They were like crazy religious and they don't care about their lives. They're going to defend what they believe. They had to admit that they didn't know. It was the responsibility of the Sanhedrin to know the difference. That's what they're there for. And the fact that the Sanhedrin said, we don't know, Jesus basically made them look like fools. You're the smartest. Everybody comes to you for these decisions. And you don't know? I don't have to answer your question. And he goes on. Okay? There was a lot that, that would happen a lot between different rabbis. And that's how rabbis would take students from other rabbis, okay? That was common. But you don't do this with the Pharisees. And you don't do this with the Sanhedrin to the point that if you disagreed with them, they send the temple guard after you. And they arrest you for blasphemy, okay? So yeah, this, this doesn't happen very often. So that was a very bold move for Jesus to do but he knew what he was doing. Jesus gives us some parables, parables of the two sons, the vineyard and the wicked husbandman, marriage of the king's son. We see most of those in Matthew. All three of the parables indict the Jewish leaders, telling them how inept they are, okay? In the parable of the two sons, the Jewish leaders represent the unsatisfactory son who did not do his father's will. They are the wicked husbandmen in the next parable. And lastly, they're the condemned guests of the king's feast. So you can see that the way that Jesus is teaching at this point is very different now. He is not shading anything anymore. He knows his time is coming and he's going to have to tip the scales to the point where they must arrest him in order to set the wheels in motion for his crucifixion. So he is just coming right out now. Then we've got the Jewish leaders taking aim at Jesus, expecting to discredit him in front of the same audience. And they ask Jesus three questions. We've seen these before. The Pharisees asked if it was lawful to pay taxes to Rome. If Jesus says it wasn't lawful, they would report him to the Roman authorities, wipe their hands clean of the matter. If he said it was lawful, then the Jews would reject him because God was their only king. And by paying taxes to another king, you're turning against God. Trick question, okay? His questioners knew that this was a no-win situation. Jesus asked whose image was on the coin. When they replied Caesar, he said, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what belongs to him. The Sadducees who don't believe in resurrection then ask him a question about resurrection. It's a woman who was widowed and remarried, and then she was widowed again and remarried and widowed again and remarried seven times. And so she, they, they then asked Jesus, since she was married legally seven times, whose wife will she be at the resurrection? The Sadducees don't remember, they don't, they don't believe in resurrection, so they're already asking a trick question, okay? And Jesus points out how clueless they are in understanding the scriptures. They can't think of heaven in the same way they think of life on earth. It's not like we step off of earth and then earth continues in heaven. Heaven's got a different set of rules for everything because anything on earth is corrupted by sin. So we have a new set of rules in heaven. And so their question is irrelevant. Oh, you really don't understand so much that you can't even ask the question right. Next. 
Matthew tells the story as though a lawyer is continuing the tirade against Jesus. Okay, so this would be a scribe. All right, so the Pharisees had their shot, the Sadducees had their shot. Now we got a scribe that's going to be asking him a question. So the great commandment, this is the one is what is the greatest commandment? Okay, again, a trick question. Because if Jesus picks only one out of the 10, then they can use the law to say that he's not honoring the rest of the commandments. You can't pick one out of the 10. It's all or nothing. And so Jesus answers the question by giving them an answer that they totally did not expect. Which commandment did he bring? None. He didn't take anything off the Ten Commandments to answer their question. So what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your strength. And then he follows it up with the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. If everybody would do these things, then all of the law and the prophets are honored. That's the greatest commandment. So again, they couldn't trick him. Many other parables happen on Tuesday. Tuesday's a busy day. He's there from sunrise until dark. Long day for Jesus. The denunciation of the scribes and the Pharisees, eight woes that he gives. Woe to you, O scribes of the law. I mean, he lays it on. There's no parables here. He just calls it out. The widow's might offerings, Gentiles asking Jesus to be their teacher, rejection of Christ by the Jews, foretelling of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, the signs of Christ's coming, the last judgment. Day six. <sighs> Jesus is at Simon's house. While he was eating, a woman came in with this jar of expensive perfume and poured it on his head. Okay. The disciples thought this was a waste. It should have been sold. Again, this is in all four Gospels. So this isn't just confusion. Is this Mary or is this Mary in a different place? Was it a different day? Is there error? No, this is a different woman. Similar kind of thing, though. Pouring this expensive perfume over his head. But this perfume was a burial perfume. I don't know. I put this together a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if this was in preparation for his burial, that's the way it's always been taught. And I probably did have the reference once upon a time. Day seven, Thursday. So this is supper time. This is the last supper, observance of the Passover, washing of the disciples' feet, and then naming the betrayer. In Moses' Passover, death was merely avoided by washing the door frames with blood. If you remember putting blood of the lamb on the doorposts. In Jesus' Passover, death wasn't avoided. He took that death. He confronted it, and he conquered it for all of mankind. Then we got the Last Supper. The head of the company, Jesus in this case, opens up with a prayer, gives the first cup of wine for everyone in the company to drink. The head of the company then washes his hands. This is where it's believed that Jesus washed the disciples' feet. The head of the company then dips some of the bitter herbs into the salt water or vinegar and speaks a blessing. He eats some of the herbs and hands them to the others. The unleavened bread is then broken into pieces, reserving half to be eaten half after the supper, called the after dish. The second cup is then filled. The youngest in the company, which would be John, is instructed to ask questions about the significance of the Passover. And then Psalm 113 and Psalm 114 are sung. This is the Paschal meal, and this is what's celebrated still today by Jews that are celebrating that Passover meal. The third cup of wine is filled, followed by prayer. They all drink the cup. Everyone washes their hands. Supper begins by eating the unleavened bread and bitter herbs and the lamb 
everyone in the group then must at least an olive sized portion of the lamb. All of the lamb is to be consumed. Anything not eaten has to be burnt all the way. No bones of the lamb are to be broken. Now, this is the law as it was laid out way back in Leviticus. But as you see this, there's things that happen that point to Jesus every step of the way. Like this idea of no bones of the lamb are to be broken. One of the things that we know about Jesus is that when he died on the cross, usually when somebody's crucified, in order to hurry it up, the Roman guard would break their legs so that they wouldn't be able to catch a breath anymore. And then they would suffocate to death. In Jesus's case, when they came to break his legs, he was already dead. So he died of crucifixion without having his bones broken, showing again how he is the lamb. The after dish of the bread broken earlier then gets eaten. And it's believed that this is where Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body. The fourth cup of wine is the point when Jesus told them all to drink of it. And this was his blood. I don't know about y'all, but after four cups of wine, don't worry, it's not as strong as it is today. They then conclude with hymns and prayers. Now we got Psalm 115 through 118, and then the great Hallel, which is Psalm 136. We got the foretelling of Peter's denial, the final teachings that Jesus gives. I am the way, the truth, the life, the promises of the coming comforter. That's the promise of the Holy Spirit to come. The vine and the branches, Jesus is going and returning. Then we got intercessory prayers. He prays for himself. He prays for his disciples. He prays for all the future believers. And then he prays for the Father. It's a very different kind of prayer. It's a neat prayer to study. That is... Uh, I remember what what book that one was in so then jesus prays at gethsemane this is late at night from nine o'clock to around 10 30 p.m how could the disciples record jesus's prayer if they were asleep it's usually a question that gets raised about these events the word for sleeping in Aramaic, which is what language this part of the, the New Testament is written in, it means dozing, but it also means reclining. So that just means they were laying down, just kind of chilling. They weren't snoring asleep. Okay. Jesus wasn't far away from them, and he could hear them. They could hear him. Peter, James, and John did doze off at different times, probably heard different parts of the prayer. So that's why we don't get exact lining up of Jesus's prayer at this time. But the prayer is all connected. We have the betrayal, the arrest, the healing of Malchus's ear after Peter lops it off with a sword. We got this religious trial before Annas. Annas has no authority. He's not the high priest. He's the high priest's father-in-law. He has no, no say, and yet he's the one holding the trial, an illegal trial, because you're not supposed to try anybody at night. It's supposed to be in public during the day. Peter denies um, sometime after midnight, and it was before daybreak, because we know right at daybreak is when the rooster crows, and by this time, Peter had already denied him three times. We also know on Friday is when Jesus, uh, when Judas hangs himself, okay? Um, Acts 118, we see this, and some scholars contend that in the process of hanging himself, he slipped and impaled himself on a sharp rock. It says that his bowels burst asunder on the rocks below. So basically, he hit the ground and split open. Uh, then we got the civil trial before Herod Antipas that happens in there. Before Pilate, second time on Friday, then his crucifixion at Golgotha, and then the seven last sayings of Jesus. I've got all those listed in there for you. 
We got darkness, earthquake, the veil of the temple is torn, and then burial in the tomb. It could have been. I could have slowed way down on that. But next Sunday, we're not even having Bible study. So next Sunday being Easter, uh, we're doing things a little bit different here. All the volunteers are having time off. There's not going to be any nursery or anything. So time with your family during first hour and then come worship at the resurrection second hour. Okay, that's the plan. Whew. A lot of stuff. On that one that I was asking about, it says Jesus for the four years that he always teaches on that one. For me, when she poured this person upon my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Yeah. Yep. All right. Cool. Okay, that's all I got for you today. Yes, there is. And they I think they said sunrise service starts at 7.30. 7.15, 7.30, I think. Is it 7? Okay. 